And such trust have we through Christ the Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, you know, verse number two, often quoted verse, right? We hear all the time that we're written epistles known and read of all men, which is true, but here in these verses we find a little bit of context. Verse number one, the Apostle Paul is really rebuking those that always need a pat on the back. Look at it again. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? He's saying, when it, chapter number one, chapter number two, he's talking about how faithful this church has been to the things that the Apostle Paul's preached. He's preached, uh, you know, talked to him about how they not only received the things that he preached to them, but uh, Timotheus and Sylvanius also. He goes on and says, y'all just soak it up. Accept it, not as words of men, but words of God. You let God apply it to your hearts, and you live it faithfully. He says, hallelujah. Gives, you know, he even says, and we give praise and honor to God, right, for your, your faithfulness. He says, we think of you often, right? Our thanks is you. When you go out and do the works of your heavenly Father, he says, we give thanks for that. We don't want a claim for it. We want to praise God for the things that you do. So here he says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Well, what's a commendation? That's a, that's a piece of paper that says, you did a good job. That's, that's hillbilly term for commendation, Brother Tommy. Right? You did good, and here's a piece of paper that says so. Right? That's a commendation. Right now, they can be as simple as you know you were student of the month this month, right? And then insert name here, or it could be you know five feet long worth of scroll work of somebody saying how good of a job you did. But a commendation is, hey, you did a good job. Okay, well he says, do we begin to commend ourselves? Here he's talking in the third person. You know what that means? He says, do I write you a commendation telling you how good of a preacher y'all had when I was there? Right now, that's a rhetorical question, but the answer is no. Right? And then he goes on to say, Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? He says, Do you guys need me to write you a letter to let you know how your spirituality is going? Granted, the reason he's writing them a letter in the first place, well, he wrote 1 Corinthians, and now he's writing a second epistle to them. The reason he's writing a letter is because he can't physically be there in the flesh. He's not there. He doesn't know the day-to-day -day going on to these people's lives. He gets second and third-hand reports from people that have been there that he's sent as either missionaries or the pastor of the church, those in the church writing letters to the Apostle Paul. Reputation. How many times do you read through the epistles where he says, your works are known of men throughout all of Asia? Right? He said, I hear the reputation. But, but what's a letter with my name at the bottom of it signed the Apostle Paul, right? With your name written on it, it says, you're doing a good job for Jesus. He says, what value is that to you? If you need a piece of paper from a preacher or from a Bible college or from any other person that says, you're doing a good job being a Christian, your goals are set a little low. Right? Well, he goes on to say, or letters of commendation from you. The Apostle Paul says, no offense. Again, these are rhetorical questions. That means the answer is obvious. But do you think that the Apostle Paul would have stopped preaching if he didn't receive a letter from every member of this church saying, Hey, uh, Paul, Brother Paul, we, we love you. You did a great job while you was here. God really used you, and you're the best, pre best preacher in the world in my book. Do you think he's going to throw in the towel? No. Right? If you got saved because you wanted other people to be happy with the decision you made, you may not have got saved. If you did get saved, but afterwards, everything you do associated with your Christianity is for somebody else to recognize and give you a commendation for it, you're not doing it for the right reason. And if you stop doing the things that you do for Christ because somebody didn't send you a commendation, you're not doing it for the right reason. Right? With their lips they do honor me, but their heart is far from me, as Jesus said. They do the right thing for the wrong reason. Right? What's the answer to all those questions? He says, no, we don't need it. 
need a commendation from y'all to let us know how great of a job or how bad of a job we're doing. Right? Who's our biggest critic? Ourselves. I know what I am. Right? I got to live with it every day looking in the mirror. Right? I have to come to terms with the fact that every week it can be set on 40 degrees up here on the air conditioning unit, but I'm going to be sweating like crazy up here. Right? I've come to terms with you know certain things. Other things, I also know when I'm giving my best and when I'm not giving my best. I may be able to fool you, may be able to fool everybody but God in heaven. But the truth is, I know what it is that I do, and I know to what capability I do it. Whether I give it my all or I don't. Piece of paper ain't going to change the fact that because you thought I did a good job, I know deep down in the gable end of my soul that I didn't give it everything that I had. It's not going to validate the fact that, oh, well, see, people understand if I get busy. Well, God doesn't. By him and through him do all things consist, yet he says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He literally is in charge of everything that's going on. Made it all, and because he made it, he's the one that keeps it all in spinning, you know, the way that it's supposed to be. Keeps all the molecules deep down inside of you from just bursting apart. Right? But yet, he still has time for you. So you're saying it's unreasonable that as crazy and as hectic as life is that we don't have time for him? God doesn't understand that. He gave his best for us. He expects our best in return. Right? But, verse number 2, he says, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts. He said, you know what commendation or what letter? That's what epistle means. But he says, you want to know what letter we really need? He says, you are the letters. He says, I don't have to be there to read it. He says, word gets around. We'll get to that here in a second. But he says, all the commendation that I need, right, one, comes from God. But two, he says, you know what really does my heart good? It's not a pat on the back. It's seeing people that take what God gave me and that I've labored with and that I've studied over and that I've traveled a great distance to give you. And you accept it, and you go out and you live it. You don't just hear it, you receive it. Right? It gets past your eardrum, and it makes its way down into your heart. Right? He's, which goes on to say, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know who a commendation's read by? The person that received it. You know what an epistle is read by? A letter? Everybody that it's addressed to. Right? If a letter comes in like from missionaries or you know, somebody sends a church and it's addressed to the Emmanuel Baptist Church, if it has something to do with you know, church and it's not just junk mail, right? the pastor will put it up there on the bulletin board out in the hallway. You know why that is? Because it's addressed to you. It wasn't addressed to him. It's addressed to all of us as the church. Do you know who got to read and got to hear this epistle? Everybody that was a member at the church of Corinth. If the Apostle Paul wrote a commendation, you know who would have received it? That church only. And it wouldn't have been in your Bible. But this epistle, though it was written to the church of Corinth, you know who it was addressed to? Christians. You know why you've got it here today? Because God addressed it to you when he told the Apostle Paul to pen it. That's why he preserved it, and that's why it's a part of your Bible. Because the Apostle Paul wrote it to a church at Corinth, but God in vision when he told him to pin it down that he was writing it to you just as much as he was to these people. Right? Well, a commendation, that gets hung on a wall. That doesn't travel. It doesn't go nowhere. Word of mouth doesn't spread. Somebody may come in and say, oh, that's a fancy looking piece of paper. Don't take time to read it. The value in a commendation is to the person that received it. Right? The value of the letter is to all those that will hear it. Right? Well, he says, ye are epistles. Written in his heart, as he said, our hearts. But he says, known and read of all men. You know who your life is addressed to? The world. Are we not to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world? Are we not to take the gospel and preach it to every living creature? Right? Your life is not addressed to yourself or your family or those that you choose to have in it. Your life, the letter of your life, is addressed to the world. And whether you like it or not, they're reading it every day. He says, known, 
and read of all men. Everybody that knows you, they're reading you. People that you haven't met yet, they don't know you yet, but if God wants them to know you, they're going to know you and they're going to start reading your epistle. But he, does, he says, not written with ink. But what's it written with? It's written on the fleshy tables of the heart. Ink can be washed away. Ink can smear. Right? Ink over time can fade. Because back in the day, you know how they made black ink? They took iron and they mixed it with a bunch of other stuff and the iron's what made it black. Right? And they would take blue metals or rocks and they'd grind it up and they'd put it in and that'd make a blue pigment. Right? Same thing with red and then every other color of the rainbow nowadays. Right now they got all that artificial synthetic stuff that they can turn things blue. But if you still get like one of them old fountain pens, you know what makes fountain pen ink the color that it is? Metal. That's why the nib on it is metal because it has to be stronger than the ink or the ink will wear it away. Right? But that old ink, you know what black ink would do after time? It would start to rust because of exposure to the air. Eventually one day it's just not on the page no more. That's why if anybody ever tells you they've seen the original Hebrew and Greek that the Bible's written in, they're a liar. Okay, parchment long gone, not around no more. But here he's saying it's not written with pen. Not written with quill, not put on parchment. He says, your letter's written into your very heart. He says, you know what people are reading out there? They may not be looking at your heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh on the heart. But we know that the Bible... Tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know that your heart, wherever your desire is, that's what you're going to pursue. But the Bible tells us if we set our sights and affections on earthly things, we will labor for earthly things. Wood, hay, and stubble. If we set our sights on heavenly places, right, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. But the, well, but Jordan, people don't know what's on my heart. No, but what's on your heart comes out through the way that you walk, the way that you talk, the way that you live, the things that you do, the places you go, the people you associate with. That's all a part of your epistle. And you know why it's so strong, so powerful, why the Apostle Paul says that's good enough for us. That's all the letters that we need. Is you going out and living your life for Christ in front of other people. Because if it's etched in your heart, it doesn't change no matter what time of day it is, whether it's a good day, whether it's a bad day, whether you've been stressed, whether you've been sick, whether you're on cloud nine, whether you're high on the mountaintop, way down in the valley, if it's etched in your heart, written on fleshy tables, you know what that means? It's a part of you. It doesn't change. You are constant in what is in your heart. That's why people that can't make up their mind are always chasing after something. Right? Never going to be satisfied. Because they don't have anything in their heart on what they're set on pursuing, so they're never going to be satisfied with whatever they get. Right, well, he goes on to say, verse number three, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. He says, when people say that you go down to church at Emmanuel Baptist Church, he says, they know what that means. But, well, they should know what that means. If not, it's our fault for them not knowing but he's saying, when you claim to be a member of this church, and they say, well, what kind of church is it? The one that Jesus started? They should know what tribe you are. They should know what it is that you believe. He says, when you go out and you are read, right, by the world, and they say, oh, that one comes from down there at Emmanuel. Right? Well, what's what, what? They, they got a thing about only using one version of the Bible. No, we got a thing about using the Bible and not a perversion. Right? Well, they've got a thing about, you know, standards. Yeah, because God said you should have some. Right? We just believe the Bible. Well, what about that? Is it in the Bible? No? Then no, we don't do that. No, I do not practice Lent. Every year, people, oh, what are you giving up for Lent? Nothing. I'm giving up Lent for Lent. I do it every year. Why? I mean, I can take you and show you in the Bible where other people did it, and you know what God called it? Idolatry. Like, well, do you do this? Do you do that? No. Because it's not in the Bible. Most of the time they'll say, yeah, it is. No, it's not. 
I would love to take you through every page of the Bible and show you that it's not, but I'll give you this challenge. Go find where it's in the Bible, and then I'll say that I'm wrong. They're never going to find it. Is it because Brother Jordan knows all this? No. Because Brother Jordan was, there's this thing called discipleship, right? Where when you get saved, people teach you some things, right? Apologetics, why you believe what you believe, right? And then, one, growing up in church my whole life, and two, studying the Bible on my own, there's these things called doctrines. You know what that means? That's what the Bible says. That's, all they do. That's what doctrine means. Right? And there's things that the Bible says, and there's things that the Bible don't say. And then this will blow some of y'all's minds. Right? Even if it's something that I've never studied before. Right, Brother Ernie, I got this thing on the inside of me called the Holy Ghost that bears witness with my spirit and tells me what his spirit wants me. And it'll tell me, eh, that ain't right. Body it because the Spirit's supposed to lead and God is in all truth. He promised to do so. But what do you tell people it's not in the Bible? No, most of the time I don't start off with that one. I say, ah, that don't sound right. I don't think I've heard that before. Right? And then it's usually more of a conversation. But people should know that this is the final, first and final authority in your life. Just because of where you go. Because of what you tell them you believe. Right? That's what he said. He says, they're they going to know where you came from. You wanted them Jesus crowd. Right? Well, then he goes on to say, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust we have through Christ to Godward. In other words, he's saying, y'all are letters written. He says, that's all the letters, commendations we need that God put his seal of approval on you when you got saved because he sealed you with the Holy Ghost and he promised that he'd keep your soul from sinning forevermore. He made you a king and a priest. He robed you in his own righteousness. He said God gave you his seal of approval. He says that's good enough for us. And on top of it, what verse number four means, and such trust have we through Christ to God. In other words, he's saying, I believe that God got such a good hold of you that, verse number five, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. He says, I believe that God got such a good hold of you that only God could have done it. He says, our faith, our trust, our hope is not in how good of a preacher the Apostle Paul is. It's not in how good of a preacher Timothy was or Sylvanius or any of the other preachers that these guys heard. What then Peter when he got up and preached on the day of Pentecost? Right? It was in one man, the man Christ Jesus. He says, it's not in my faith on how sufficient I am as a preacher. He says, my faith is not in how sufficient you are as a Christian. Because though the Spirit is indeed willing, the flesh is weak. Sometimes we just can't. Other times we choose not to. Right? And then on some days we don't even stop to even think of the question. Right? What is that? It's called you trying to reign in your flesh he said take up your cross and follow him right Jesus left his cross on Calvary well why are we supposed to carry ours because I got something that still needs to stay nailed to it the flesh I can't get rid of it I got to take it with me but I got a place to put it where it'll stay out of the way right? the apostle Paul himself wrote I die daily what's he saying I got to nail my flesh to the cross every day he says my my faith and my hope and how sufficient I am as a Christian. Did he not say of himself that he was the chiefest of sinners? Did he not write, O wretched man that I am? The Apostle Paul thought very little of himself in the flesh. He said, I don't think I'm a good enough preacher. He says, I don't think I'm a good enough Christian. So if God did something in your life, it wasn't because of me. It's because God chose to do it and God did it. He says, if you go out, he goes on to say, right, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Here he's talking our, referring to him and the church. Before this, he was using the, the royal we, the royal our, where he was talking about himself. But here he's saying, collectively. He says, our sufficiency is not in how good we are as church members. Right? None of us are good enough church members that when a lost person comes in, they're going to get saved. None of us are good enough tithers that we can merit God's favor. 
Right? You can't live holy enough that God will be uh, you know, satisfied with your life. Right? At least on this side of glory where we're still in this sin-cursed flesh. Right? You will not be what God wants you to be on this earth. Yeah, well, actually, let's, let's take that back. You will not be what God wants you to be, at least before the rapture. Because when during the millennial reign, we're coming back. So on this earth, we will be what he wants us to be because we'll have a body like his then. Okay? Right, that Brother Jordan anticipating YouTube comments. But anyway. <laughs> right, but the point that we're making, our sufficiency, right, it's not enough for us to take hope in. Right, well, what's that word sufficiency mean? Well, sufficiency means being sufficient. So what's sufficient mean? Right? Sufficient means enough to satisfy. You know what satisfy means? That means nothing's left undone. Right? Are you enough to where if God wasn't there helping you do it, that you could live the life that God wants you to live? No, that's why he gave you the Holy Ghost. Are you a good enough witness to cause somebody's heart to fall under conviction? No, that's the job and the handy work of the Holy Ghost. Are you a good enough singer that you can get up without any preparation, without praying about what God wants you to sing that week, and you can just get up and sing, and then heaven fall on the Satan? No. It doesn't matter if every note or every note is in tune. It doesn't matter if everything that the preacher says is factual. There's a difference between you doing and God putting unction on it. But he says our sufficiency isn't in how great we are. He says we rely wholly on God taking our feeble efforts and doing what only God can do. He says our faith is in the fact that he promised that if we are faithful to do what we can do, then he will be sufficient. He says, what am I sufficient for? All I am is a tool. Tool doesn't choose where it's used, how it's used how long it's used, what way it's going to be used. If you pick up a hammer, you, the hammer doesn't get to decide whether it's driving a nail or taking that one that you bent out of the wall. You decide that. But we're just supposed to be tools. Right, to use the illustration that the psalmist used, right, we're arrows in God's quiver. We ought to do our best to make sure that our fletchings are you know, nice and straight, that you know, they're all lined up right. We should make sure that we're as straight as we can be so that when God says, hey, go over there, we fly straight as an arrow. We should make sure that, you know, Lord, sharpen up my arrowhead. But at the end of the day, we're in the quiver. We don't decide when we go in the bow what he points us at or when he decides to loose us. It's our job just to be an arrow. He'll take care of everything else. But I do know that if I'm not everything that I know I ought to be, he's not going to use me. Because an archer doesn't use an arrow that is defective, that's unfinished. May have the best fletching in all the world, but if it don't have an arrowhead, it's not an arrow. Could have the sharpest arrowhead, could have the straightest shaft, but without a fletching, it's not going to fly straight. And you could have the best arrowhead and the best fletching, but if that shaft is all wonky, it's not even going to come off the arrow right. That sucker's not going anywhere. It's liable to go sideways. Well, he's saying, my faith's not in the arrow. It's in the person holding the bow that's pulling the arrow back and deciding when to let it go. So, verse number six, he says, who, referring to God, also made us able ministers of the New Testament. He says, you want to know why God is able to use me? Because God made me into what he wanted me to be. He said, God didn't save me as being able to minister. He said, God saved me, and then he turned me into a minister of the New Testament. In other words, he was saying, where God found me, he didn't leave me there. He says, but because, because God took me from where I was, and now he's got me here, and he's got another place that he wants me to go, because if he was done with us, he'd take us out of here. Right, but he says, but God made me to where I was able to do what he wanted me to do for him. He didn't make me sufficient. Right, I still have to rely on him. But he did give me the skills, 
the tools, the ability, the desire to do what it is that He wanted me to do. He made me able to do it. But we know what able means. It means you can. But whatever it is that God's called you to do, He'll prepare you for it. Even if you get the call before the preparation, the Apostle Paul, on that road to Damascus, when he said, Lord, what would you have me do? He told him then, you're going to go and you're going to preach to a whole bunch of Gentiles. He says, you're going to take Jesus and you're going to take it to them and they're going to get saved. Right? Never preached a message a day in his life. Right? At the moment, he was currently blind. Right? He had no idea how he was going to get from where he was to where it was that he was going, let alone how he was going to preach about somebody that he, up until that point, absolutely hated. He persecuted the name of Christ. But yet, he just believed that if God wanted him to do it, that God would make him able to do it. And guess what he's saying in this verse? God made me able to do it. He didn't say that he is the best in the world. He didn't say that he was you know, close to being the best. In his opinion, he wasn't even in a conversation. But he said, God made me able to do it. Right again, your best and somebody else's best, two different things. You know what God expects from you? Your best. And if he made you able to do what it is that he's called you to do, guess what that means? Your best is enough. You don't have to do what somebody else did. You just have to do what God made you able to do. All right, well. He says, made us able ministers in the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Well, you know what that letter he's talking about? He's not talking about an epistle or a commendation. He's talking about the letter of the law, the Old Testament. He says, he didn't make us a minister of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the letter, right, that told you how wicked you were and how you never could be what God wanted you to be. He just spent a few verses here telling us that God made him into what he needed to be. And that what God made him into was able to do God's will in his life. He says, the letter of the law only told us that we were sinners. He says, the letter killeth. Why? Because all those guilty of sin. If you're guilty of one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole law. Well, what's the guilty, you know, the wages of sin or what? Death. The law only brought damnation and it brought death. There was no salvation. There was only a temporary reprieve where God would push sins back for a year. But here he says, he didn't make his ministers of the law. He said, that's something that was dead. From the moment that God gave the law, man was dead. Before that, man was dead. We heard about it last week. The moment that you eat of it, ye shall surely die. But, well, what they, they died spiritually, but guess what their flesh started doing? Dying as a result of sin. Everything about the law was to show man why he was dead spiritually and why, if he died without God, he'd go to a place called hell. But you know what all the New Testament's about? Regardless of how dead you were, regardless of how much you deserve to go and, you know, die and go to hell, regardless of all the things that you did that should have brought damnation, through Christ, God can make you into what He wants you to be, and then one day you'll be just like Christ. He says, we're not ministers of the letter, for the letter killeth, but of the Spirit, does the letter kill, but the Spirit giveth life. You know what happened when you got saved? You just started living. You know why that is so true? Not just because in your flesh you was dead, not just because spiritually you was dead, but before that you had no purpose. You know what? God, God just didn't save you and say, well, okay, good job. See you when you die. Right, he said, no. Now I'm going to make you meat for the master's use. And then he didn't just, you know, make us able to do something and put us on the shelf like a trophy. No, he made us a vessel of honor. You know what that is? It's something to be used. And you know what the vessel says? The vessel shows you how much the person that's using the vessel cares about you. If you brought out a rusty old bucket and poured somebody some water out of that, they'd think that you didn't think too highly of them. 
But if you go and find the best vase that you have and use that to pour somebody a drink, right, they're going to get the picture real quick that you care about them. You didn't, you know, take cost or expense. You didn't think about time. You just wanted to do something for them regardless of what it cost you. So now imagine that letter that you are to the world. When the world looks at you, what kind of vessel do they see? Because according to these verses, God will make you into a vessel of honor so that when he sends you out into the world, the world knows that God cares about them because he sent you. Are we the rusty bucket? Are we the golden pitcher with the jewels on it? That's, I know where that person came from. How'd they get to that? Wasn't anything I did. It's what God did in me. See, where you once were dead, he not only made you alive, he made you something worth living for. He gave you a purpose, but then he prepared you to be something that when the world sees it, they would think, I can't believe that God sent that to come and help me. May not see it the first time around. Right? Anybody not like the person that first told them that they was a sinner? Right? And chances are they didn't just walk up to you and say, hey, you're a sinner. Right? But everything about their life said that I wasn't good enough. But you know what their life also said? The one that made me into what I am will make you into the same thing. Right? He, we know that he, he is love. He loved us with an everlasting love. We don't even understand how much God loves us and won't this side of heaven. Right? To, because to understand the love of God would be to know all the, about God, who God is, and our brains can't handle that. Because the Bible says He is love. You know what that means? It's a, just a part of God. We just have the slightest understanding of what it is. Right? But we're supposed to be the taxi cab that takes that love, that takes that drink of living water to the world. Is it showing up in a Rolls Royce? Or is it showing up in a jalopy? Because whatever it's being, it's showing up as, those that go out and it's like everybody they talk to, right, they actually talk to them like they care about them. When they ask a question, they listen, right? If somebody asks for advice, they don't just give the first thing that comes to mind. They actually give them something that will help them from the Word of God. may not quote Scripture to them, but they'll give them the wisdom of God. You know what that is? That's the Rolls Royce. You know why it's a Rolls Royce? Because that person has something engraved on the fleshy tables of their hearts that says, God deserves for me to be a Rolls Royce. And the people that are the jalopies, nobody wants to get in that car. You're afraid if you open the door too quick, the whole thing going to fall apart. But I don't even want to ride in it. Why would, it, why would I want to become that? Right? What value is there in that thing? Well, you know where that comes from? The epistle that's written on your heart. Because what's in here is going to work its way out, and that's what the world's going to see. But we're not going to teach on any of that. Go back to verse number 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. In other words, but Brian, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I don't even think high enough of myself to think that I can breathe on my own. He says, we don't think high enough of ourselves to think we can do anything. You want to know why you woke up today? It wasn't because of the alarm clock. It's because God woke you up. You want to know why you're going to be able to go to bed tonight if you don't have insomnia? Right? It's because God lets you go to sleep. You know why you can breathe right now? Not because your lungs are able to do it, but because God gave you the air to breathe. He's saying, we're not just talking about sufficiency when it comes to being a Christian. He says, I'm not even able to be what God made me without God's grace so with the Lord's help we're going to teach on just for a few minutes on being sufficient right I don't have to be sufficient to get somebody saved I don't have to be sufficient to be a, a Sunday school teacher right I'll be honest with y'all I told y'all when we started right 
I don't know what to teach y'all. Some of y'all been saved longer than I've been alive. Right? Let alone, I know how much I don't know. So you know what that means? Every week I got to go learn something so that I can come back and teach it to you. I don't know enough. Right? On top of that, yeah, I'm good at talking in public. But doesn't matter how good at talking you are. Right? It's about me getting out the way and trying to yield so that the Holy Ghost can use me to teach you what the Holy Ghost wants to hear. Right? It's not about pats on the back. You know what it's about? God gave me something to do. I like doing it, and I want to do it the best that I can. Doesn't matter if there are two people in here, no people in here. Right? I'm still going to go study the same. Doesn't matter if it's on the live stream when you know they tried to shut us down and then failed. Right? Or whether it's we got pack house, you know, revival's getting ready to start, everybody, you know, happy, excited, right? Or if half the church is sick and it's like half dead in here because everybody coughing and got the flu. Don't matter. I know I'm not sufficient enough. Right? Now the dangerous thing is I also know that I'm able to get up and wing it. Right? Not because I know so much, but because I'm that good at convincing people I know what I'm talking about. That's why it's dangerous. All them speeches that I gave, half of them didn't, didn't even try. Why? Because I knew I could get away with it. Right? Well, as Christians, there are times we know what we think we can get away with. Right? We don't see things as, what does God expect? We think, what do I have to do to meet the bare minimum? There is no bare minimum. Either we are able to do it, or we are not able to do it. And then based on whether or not you can or can't, then there's a whole other question, which is, did you do it, or did you not do it? All right, well, let's look at that ability thing. You realize that God knew you didn't even have enough common sense to get saved without Him giving you a measure of faith? The Bible says God gave unto every man a measure of faith. You know what that means? He gave everybody just the amount of faith that they needed in order to get saved. And he gave the same amount to everybody. Because it's his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what that means? You didn't even have the ability to believe that what God said was true without God in his foreknowledge knowing that you needed a little bit extra. You're not enough on your own. But you can be sufficient to do what God wants you to do. I'm not sufficient to put all the pieces together and to make God's plan come to fruition. If that were the case, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross. If we were able to do the will of the Father to His degree of approval, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Holy Ghost wouldn't be here right now. But, on the other hand, ability is something completely different. Ability is... Does God taking what you were because we know that wasn't good enough and as he worked on you to make it into something enough you realize that all it takes for God to use somebody is them being will or willing to be used it's called availability I wrap my head sometimes trying to figure out why God would use Samson who was a whoremonger use Moses who was a murderer continue to use David after a sin where he became not only an adulterer but then a murderer you say well, why because they made themselves available to be used and they desired to be used of God were they perfect no they weren't sufficient Samson wasn't strong enough even with his hair you know uncut uh, David wasn't wise enough as a king or smart enough as a general on the battlefield or strong enough as a warrior Right? Moses didn't have anything in that staff of his that made the waters part. Right? Aaron, we, we, he was supposed to go and talk for Moses, never said a thing. Right? So we know he wasn't good enough talking to get the will of God done. Right? Go look at people throughout. The, you know what God uses? God uses the things that people think can't be used to do something great. Most of the time that's because of availability. But if you make yourself available and God decides, decides to use you, He will make you able to do whatever He wants you to, to do. Right, you know how much I knew about teaching when I started this class? Very little. You know how much I know now? Just a little bit more. Not much. 
but it's given me the ability to do it by faith. If I knew how to do it, I wouldn't trust God to let me do it. If you knew all the answers and how God wanted to use you and what you were going to have to do and when, then you could plan God out all. You know what He gives you the ability to do? What He wants you to do today. He didn't give you the strength to do everything for today and tomorrow today. You'll get that tomorrow if the sun come up. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Yesterday gone. Tomorrow not here yet. All you got is today. So He gives you the strength for today. He gives you the energy for today. He gives you the wisdom for today. Why do you think David said, Early will I seek thee? Right? Lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Why is that? My understanding not enough. But He'll give me the ability to get in His Word and be led by the Holy Ghost to where He'll give me the understanding I need for today. Can't look for tomorrow's understanding. That's tomorrow. He may give me peace on the, making a decision today, but He's not going to give me the understanding to figure out how we get from here to where He said we're going to go by His you know, guidance. He just says, hey, that's the right direction. Go that way. Okay, Lord, well, how do we get there? He says, let's start here today. Well, what about tomorrow? No, today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. We'll get to that when tomorrow becomes today. You know what God's focused on? Today. Because if God wasn't, He wouldn't be omnipresent. He wouldn't be all, but He'd be just waiting on us at the end. But no, God's just as much here as He is in the last chapter and everything after that. God cares enough that He's present all the time. Well, if He wants you to do today, you know what that means? i got to figure out what He wants me to do today. And He's promised. Right? He made His kings and priests to rule and reign over this flesh. He made His priest so that we could enter directly into the throne room of God and not have to go to the intermediary. Well, our high priest is God Himself. Right? Well, what's all that mean? He made you able to do everything you need to do for your own spirituality so that you could do it. You don't have to put your faith in somebody else. You can put your faith in God and believe that if you do what He told you to do, everything will come out all right on the other side. What's that? That's saying, Lord, make me able to do what you want me to do. Is it going to happen like this? No. That's why He gives us trials. That's why He gives us high points. Right? To look back and say, Lord, you really brought us a long way. You know what that is? That's looking back and saying, Lord, you've taught me a lot. You've made me able to do a lot of things. But when we look back down in the valley, God says, well, we got more to do. You may use some of them tools from before to do what you're going to do today, but you may need another tool in the toolbox. God's going to work on you. It's a never-ending process. But then there's the question of not ability, but faithfulness. You could be the best, but you could be Billy Sunday, right? You could be John the Baptist, who, according to Jesus, was the greatest man born a woman. You could be John the Baptist, be the greatest person ever born. And I believe, you know, he's probably one of the best preachers of all time, too. Why do you say that? Because there was a voice crying in the wilderness as John preaching up a storm. Right? Well, John the Baptist couldn't just come up and wing it. He couldn't come up and preach what he preached yesterday. He didn't go out and baptize people hoping that what he baptized people with yesterday was enough to get people baptized today. He didn't walk around the wilderness preaching that, well, you know, up until yesterday, you had to repent, but today you don't have to repent. Today, if you just come and you listen, if you're a part of what we're doing, that'll be enough. No, every day he got up and said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And he'd go out and he'd preach it. When people would repent, you know what he did? He'd baptize them as a sign that they died out to them former selves and that they were risen in newness of life. That a change had taken place. You know what John was asking God to do? Lord, give me what I need so that you can change somebody's life today. But if he went out and he preached, there was a difference between just phoning it in and preaching Right, not talking about getting loud not talking about hooping and hollering or sweating and spitting 
Right? Sometimes God's real mellow. Sometimes God brings a real low. He wants people to be focused. Right? He's trying to deal with them in here about what's going on in here. And then other time he just peels back the roof and then pours a little bit of glory in here. Everybody goes slap nuts. Right, what do you say? And each way. The preaching, the singing. Right? You could get up and preach the same message twice. God be on it both times. But it's going to be two different complete services. Why is that? Because God's taking your ability, what you were able to do, and He's honoring your faithfulness with what you couldn't do. You really think that you're a good enough prayer that God's going to answer it? No, God winks at our ignorance. And He takes our faithfulness and our obedience because He told us to pray. In fact, He told us to pray four different ways. There's prayer at talking with God, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. He said, prayer's so good, I'm going to give you four different ways to do it. He says, and do all of them. And on top of that, he said that he would that men everywhere would lift up holy hands. We're working on that. I'm not going to preach on that today. But what's he saying? He told us to pray. So if we do our best to pray, where we try to shut out the world and we try to reign in this flesh, we're trying to get our spirit lined up with God's spirit to where they're one. Because that's what the idea of prayer is. Right? If we do our best to do that, you really think that you can pray hard enough that your will is going to be perfectly lined up with God's will? No, God's tweaking your will in your heart for you. He's taking your ability and honoring what you can't, what you could do and doing what you can't do. You really think that you're a good enough singer that you can hit a high note that causes somebody to realize that God's dealing with their heart? No, it's not in, it's not in the tune. A lot of times it's not even in the words because they're tuning you out anyway. Right? God takes the fact that you're getting up and singing, honoring and praising Him because you have a desire to praise Him because you love Him for what He did in your life. And you're just trying to worship God. And he takes that little bit of worship that we can do and He does what we can't do. And next thing you know, it dawns on somebody, that's what conviction is, where God convinces you that what you need is what's going on. But that's just doing what you can't your best. I've been thinking about this ever since preacher preached. But when Jesus said, let her alone, she did what she could, talking about Mary. You know what he was saying? She did all that she could. You know, that means she didn't do one thing that she couldn't do. And she didn't leave out one thing that she could do, and she didn't do it. She did what she could. You know what that meant? God made her able to do it, and she did it. All of it. Nothing left, nothing more. But what's God expect from you? Just that. What you can. Well, I'm not enough. He knows that. But he just wants you to be what you can be, and he'll take care of the rest. Do you say, well, I don't understand how I'm going to be able to do that. Well, he's going to make you into something that's able to do that. Just worry about today. Do what you can today. And that'll be sufficient for God to be the sufficiency in your life. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.